If you or someone you know has diabetes, you may have built up an extra supply of test strips and lances. That's where we come in. We'll buy the supplies that you don't need and resell them to those in need to prevent waste. Help us make diabetes management more affordable. Visit us at teststripswithaz.com. Anthony Rocco Martin back on the program. He returns to action November 9th in Moscow, Russia, taking on Ramazan Amiv. Anthony, how are you, man? It's been a minute. I'm doing great, man. I thank you. Appreciate you for having me back on. And, you know, I'm looking forward to heading to Russia. I don't know how you'd want to leave this beautiful weather behind because you're, uh, you're soaking it in right now. It looks a lot better than where I'm at in Massachusetts where it's cold and cloudy and it's about to start raining. You're, there's not even a cloud behind you at all. No, it's 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 about seventy five and sunny right now, so that's there's not a lot of sun left. So I'm over here trying to get as much in as possible. You know, had to rush it with a nice little tan and uh, go out there and do my business. Like like I said at the beginning, it's been a minute since we talked, and in fact, despite different efforts in the past, I know there has been management shifts, there's been name changes, changes in weight class, and all that. And I think the last time we actually spoke was before you fought Johnny Case over two years ago. It's been that long. Wow. A lot of things have changed since you last spoke, haven't they? That's a lot of things have changed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, with all the changes that you've had, what would you say is like the biggest difference, the biggest change in you since June of 2017? Because like we're always growing, we're always changing, we're always evolving. What do you think is the biggest difference between Tony Martin in 2017 to Anthony Rocco Martin in October of 2019? Just my mental game. I think that mentally I'm so much uh, stronger. And I think that it's more just my confidence is sky high. And I just feel like I'm doing all the right stuff is, is the main key. When do you think all that changed for you? Because I, I know I've interviewed you in the past and I felt like with each interview, your confidence grew a little bit more. You kind of opened up a little bit more. Seeing past interviews since we've last spoke, you've opened up even more. When do you think things changed for you in that aspect? I think it's all just been a slow progression. I think it's just been one of those things where I needed more time. I was still working on my striking. And then, you know, finally that started to click. And then it was just kind of this progression, natural progression of, you know, worrying about my skill set and then worrying about where I'm going to be at and what's the best place for me uh, in my personal life as, as long as, as well as my uh, business life. Obviously, a big fight coming up for you in a couple of weeks. So I want to go back a few months to the fight with Damian Maya because it was a very interesting fight. You did lose a majority decision, but I think, and I know a lot of other people agree with me on this, you proved that you belonged in fights with guys in the top 10 in that performance. Like the third round, you were really close to stopping it at different points. And had it been a five-round main event, we may be having a different conversation right now. And I know based on past interviews heading into that fight, you seem to have more of a either you win or lose attitude to the fight game. You heard yeah. some of my takeaways from that fight. Were you able to at least take anything away from that fight in Minneapolis? I mean, I'll be 100% honest with you. Like, mentally going into that fight was probably the, the worst uh, mental spot I've been in, I think, throughout my whole entire life. So I've been kind of, you know, trying to figure out, you know, getting a good balance again of my personal and business life. So it's, you know, I really went in that fight and, this is why I try to take that Gunnar Nelson fight on two weeks notice. And I called my, my uh, coach up and I was like, listen, you know, I'm not in as good a shape as I was in that Damien fight, but mentally I'm in a hundred percent, hundred, hundred times better place right now where I just feel like I'm a, a way better fighter. Just that mental drain. I was just mentally drained going into that one. And, but no, personally, like, like I said, I lost that fight. The only thing I could take away from it is that I, I know that I belong there. And I just got to keep proving uh, to the world and to the UFC uh, mostly that it's my time and that I belong to fighting, uh, you know, top 10 guys. I don't, I don't think I should be heading to Russia to fight uh, Ramazan and me, but uh, I don't turn down fights. I'll go wherever they want me to go. But I definitely, after this fight, I want a top 10 guy again. If you don't mind me asking, you can tell me to kick rocks if you want. What was going yeah. on heading into that Damian Maya fight? I mean, it was just a lot of personal stuff, you know, with, uh, I was going through a breakup with my girlfriend at the time. And then, um, so it's just like that part of the, of the transition of trying to figure out where to live as well. So I was trying to figure out where I'm going to stay. And then I was also going through the breakup and then there was a lot of other small drama going on with, uh, uh behind the scenes that, you know, it's, that's a lot longer story, but, uh, I mean, I, I'm disappointed, you know, I'm disappointed. I think that, I'm a way better fighter than Damien. I think he's a great fighter, but I think I'm just a lot better than him. And uh, he just, you know, fought me at the right time. 
and that's the hardest part to take from a fight is that I just don't think that I was even close to 100% going into that fight. And that's why, you know, the UFC said, hey, you want to go to Russia? I said, all right. You know, I mean, I thought I'd probably get a bigger name coming off that fight, but they offered me uh, another fight. And I said, you know, I think I'm the best fighter in the world, so I'll go fight anyone. Do you at least take solace in the fact that despite going through all that, and I know you're not using that as any excuse or anything like that, you didn't win the fight, but still, you you did have a good performance. I think you still opened up a lot of people's eyes in that fight. Do you still take solace in the fact that you were able to go in there with a legend like Damian Maia, a former title challenger on multiple occasions, and almost finish him like that? Are you able to at least have some sort of positivity in that performance with everything you were going through, not making excuses? No. <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> no, I, I don't take anything from that. I think that I, I, when I when you truly believe that you're the better fighter going into a fight and you come out with a loss, there is no winning out of that. There, there's I don't, I don't take any win off that. And I think that you know I've uh, you know I think I, I went into like a mild depression after the fight, and so I've been trying to like bounce through that and, and figure out my life and start piecing everything together. And really, I'm just starting to come out of that depression stage. Um, the last, you know, month or two here out in Atlanta now. And I, I, I was just out in Thailand not too long ago, and I was just, I was up in the mountains there, and I was just like, man, mentally I just felt so great, and I was just like, this is, I was depressed, man. I, I, I've never really been depressed. And I don't think you really even know you're depressed until you start coming out of the depression, and you're like, wow, you know, you just feel so much better. So I don't take anything, I don't take a win out of that. I think that I beat Damian uh, 9 out of 10, and that was his one and only shot. You know, props to him. There's, you know, I have no excuses. Obviously, he, he was the better man, and, and he's probably dealing with his own stuff as well. So it's not like it's a one-sided thing. So, no, nah, I mean, I don't take any win out of that. I think I should have dominated that fight. I think I should have put Damian away. So you feel like the, the trip to Phuket, the trip to Thailand, experiencing all those things, that kind of brought you out of your funk? Yeah, I mean, mostly just hanging out with uh, the Lima brothers and Jacao, and then Will Brooks is out here, and I'm just like, everyone's just so happy over here, you know, it's all positivity, everyone's working as a, we got a small group, but man, we have like the strongest welterweight group in the world, I feel like, um, and then so, I just feel like they've really helped me as well, just be a, just a happier person overall, and just less drama in my life, man, I'm having a lot less drama, so it's just... That part has been really good. The, the move out here has been, uh, you know, really opened my eyes that uh, I, I'm really loving it here. So I'm happy, and that's the main key. And I think a happy, happy Tony is going to be a, a machine out there, and I think that uh, November 9th, that everyone's going to really see what I'm capable of. What would you say is, like, the, the big story from that trip? Like, if someone asked you 10 years from now, hey, remember when you went to Phuket? Anthony, yeah. like, what do you remember about that trip the most? Like, what's the story you're going to tell? Man, the main thing is it's so, I want to say, like, mentally relaxing of, you know, you go train and it's outdoors, it's hot, and it's just like, but you're just training and then you go back and everything's so cheap, so you're not cooking your own food, you know, because you go out to eat. It's it's five bucks for a full-blown meal there. So I'm like, so you go out to eat, you're not doing any cleaning, all you're doing is going to the beach afterwards, relaxing, getting ready to hydrate, getting ready for that next training session, and then you're training with all the top guys in the world. It was just so mentally relieving that it was you left that place and you're like, dang, I got to go back to the real world. That's kind of the thing. Like you're, you're almost like in this fantasy land of a training world where I feel like anyone that's single or doesn't have kids, if you're not moving to Thailand, you're insane. So that's how I truly, I truly, I truly believe this. If I didn't have a daughter, I would 100% be living in Thailand right now. Do you feel like you learned things about yourself during that trip that you didn't know about yourself before you went? I mean, I just more just, you obviously, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't want to say I really learned more about myself, but I would just say that, you know, like when people say they want to go on a vacation or what they're trying to do is just like let loose and just feel that the world off their back. That's kind of how I felt out there. I just felt like the whole world coming off your back and everything's so peaceful. You just feel, you know, like almost a meditation out there when you're, you're training and only, only thing you're focusing on is, is your training regimen and then just kind of just enjoying life and it'd be nice to kind of find a group like that out here fully. So it was more of uh, just finding a fresh perspective on things more than, you know, finding new things about yourself. Yeah. It was just, you know, just that, that stress of relief of life, you know, you just kind of, 
you can forget about everything back home for a while, go out here and uh, just enjoy the what you really love the sport for. How are you digging the – the? because you've been a part of some big teams, obviously being at ATT in Florida. I mean, that's just a massive team with so many fighters. Now you're at yeah. ATT Atlanta. Like you said on Instagram, it's a it's a smaller group, but you know a bunch of killers in there. There's no crew better, I believe, was the exact word you used on Instagram. What is that atmosphere like being with a smaller crew? And you talk about the positivity. What has the atmosphere been like since you made the move to, to ATT Atlanta and working with those guys? Yeah, really, I, I feel like – so the thing even down at American Top Team in Florida, Coconut Creek, is that – you'd still have to call guys to come in and train because you need the right looks or you need like high level guys. So all the high level guys there are kind of trying to do their own thing and train on their own schedule. And, you know, a lot of them, you know, I, I'm not going to talk too much crap, but they, they kind of are pampered a little bit with, uh, you know, everything's built around them. We're out here. We're full blown team here. You know, we're, we're these guys, uh, you know, Diego just fought out in Australia. So we all went out to Thailand together, did all that training together. We got Douglas fighting out in uh, Connecticut this weekend, so I, I'm heading out there tomorrow. Those guys are already out there, so we're going to get some crazy training out and, uh, out there before the Bellator fights and before he uh, gets his strap back from Rory. And then I fight, and then right away, you know, Jacal fights again as well. So it's right after everyone's done training, they're back in the gym because we're like, hey, we got to help each other out. So it's not, you know, like a big gym. They just expect there's so many bodies, so they, they'll fight, and then you won't see them for months. Um, so it's just a, a tight knit group, man. Like we're, we're really finding a group here. And, and I think that having that, that, uh, give and take with each other is so beneficial that you won't see at American top team in coconut Creek. So out here, we are, you know, we're still at ATT in Atlanta, but it's just that you have a, a bigger respect for each other and, and respect each other's time and ex- respect their fights too, that you're helping them train as well. Do you feel like you've had that sort of camaraderie in your training camps before? Is this the first time you've really had this kind of close knit feeling with your team and your teammates? Well, yeah, I mean, I would say maybe like a bigger one, but you know, obviously in Boston, I had a good, good couple of teammates there, but they're all smaller guys. And then, you know, down in Coconut Creek, I had a couple guys that were, that would, I could always call upon and they would come out, but I've never found guys that are such high level and so giving of their time as well, which is other than Brock, you know, my main coach from uh, St. Cloud, uh, which was always been in my corner, always will be, you know, he's the most given guy I've ever met in my life. But outside that, you know, these guys are so giving of, you know, of everything. So I'm just really appreciating it out here. And, and we have a really good crew. You know, we got Mikey Graves out here as well. And then, uh, so, I mean, I couldn't ask of a better place to just, Cause I really didn't know where I was going to go. I knew, I knew I kind of needed a transition out of, uh, down at ATT and Coconut Creek where, you know, I just wasn't the, you know, obviously with the split with my girlfriend and then, uh, just some other drama was going on. It probably wasn't the best place for me. So I was like, I needed to move. So actually I bought this RV. So I bought this camper. And, uh, so now I'm out here in Georgia. I didn't know where I was going to go. So I'm like, I don't really want to get a, an apartment or something, some random place for sign a year at least and not know where I'm going. So I'm loving it, man. I, I really like it. I'm enjoying life. Uh, I, I can't remember the last time I've been this happy. Well, that's great to hear, man. In terms of the fight coming up with, with Ramazan, did you know a lot about him? Like, I know, I'm sure you've learned a bunch along the way getting ready for this fight, but he hasn't really been the most active fighter. He's only fought three times since 2017. He hasn't fought yeah. in over a year due to injuries and visa issues and stuff. Was he a guy that was even on your radar at all? I've never heard of him. So... I was actually offered a different fight that I accepted in Russia. It was a guy that was a no-namer as well. Like, a guy's never fought in the UFC even. And originally, you know, the last thing you want to do is really come off a loss and then be heading to Russia to fight. But, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it as just an opportunity to really showcase my skill set. I, when I, I truly believe I'm the top fighter in the world, so I'm not scared to go and fight anyone. I mean, if they're going to give me these easy wins like this, I'll take them. And I don't think Ramazan's an easy fight. I just think that that's how good I am. I think I, I get, have a skill set. But I've never heard of him, you know, before this fight. But obviously, like you said, you know, I've done my research. He's 3-0 in the UFC. He came in and beat Sam Elvey right away. Uh, I think he's going to come out there and try to squeak out a decision. You know, I'm going to be coming out there to take him out. I, got, I have to put these next two guys away. I got two fights left on my contract. And I think that I'm in a spot in the UFC where – uh, I have no choice but to put these next two guys away 
and to really show the UFC that uh, I'm, a, I'm a real contender. Do you feel like with a, you know, with a big performance on November 9th that you can go to the UFC ahead of time and be like, let's, let's work this out, let's extend this thing, let's get a new deal put together? Or are you willing to, to sort of fight out your deal at this point and, and see if the grass is greener elsewhere? Like, what's your mentality on that with two fights left in your deal? Yeah, I don't, think, I don't see them trying to sign me after this next fight no matter what. So I think that, uh, I mean, we've always had this thing. I got to start repairing my relationship with the UFC. I think there's, <laughs> <laughs> I got to stop talking shit so much. You know, I just feel like, listen, you know, because I, I really do like, there's some parts about the game that, you know, you really don't like. And then I'm so, so I'm a, kind of a guy that's always been vocal. Like, I really don't care. But I do, I have been happy in the UFC most of my career. And they do give you this platform to be, you know, on the biggest stage in the world. So I am appreciative of that. And really, you know, I've been pretty hard on Sean Shelby as well. <laughs> <laughs> no. So like, he's got a pretty he's got a pretty tough job. You know, I'm not saying that he does the greatest job, but he has a really, really tough job. So I'm not gonna talk too much shit anymore. I'm gonna I'm gonna slow down. I'm gonna try to start repairing my relationships inside the UFC and, and really just stop being like, hey, it's me versus the world. And, uh, you know, just try to enjoy these next couple fights, put on the best show that I, I could put on. And, and really the thing that I've always had a problem with, though, the main thing is just like I've never called the UFC being like, hey, I want more money or I want an easier fight or I want this or that. I've just called the UFC every single time and saying, listen, I want the baddest motherfucker out there. I want the toughest fight. I want the fight that's going to move me up. That's all I've ever that's all I've ever complained about. So I'm like, really, I feel like that's. I don't know how you could ask for a better, you know, a better employee than a guy that's, hey, this guy wants to fight the toughest guys out there, you know? So it's not, uh, it's not like I'm trying to complain about money or anything like that because obviously I'm making pretty good money for, even though I think that every fighter should make more, but that's a whole other topic. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start reporting my relationships. That's that's the moral of the story. <laughs> well, let's 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 start right now, Anthony, because yeah. we're we're in a happy place. You got the RV, the sun is shining. You went to Phuket. Yeah. You're you're in a great place right now. So let's say something nice about the UFC. Let's let's start with Sean Shelby. Say something nice about Sean Shelby, and then we'll go from there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, like I was saying though, it's like this is the toughest thing about being Sean Shelby. This is what I would say. This is how me being nice is. Okay. Being Sean Shelby is like every time that someone contacts you, you're wondering like, what do they want from you? You know what I mean? So it's like one of those things where you're almost like, do I even really have any true friends anymore? Or are these guys like being nice to me because they like me for who I am? Or are they just being nice to me because they want something or, you know, so I mean, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, living life like that. That'd be a tough life to live. So it's like, you almost, you know, you don't want to get too close to fighters as well. Like, you don't want to be too nice to these guys because last thing you want to do is have one of these fighters be your good buddy and then be like, hey, man, I got to cut you. It's just not working out. Like, that's the last thing you want to do is make a phone call to one of your buddies and saying that. So, I mean, I get that he's in, like, a really hard spot and that – so I kind of see his point of view of running the business. And, and really, you know, think about this. This is the craziest thing I would say about the UFC as well. I like originally like last year I started watching from uh, from uh, UFC one on you know and you see the real progression Dude, like you see like you like you hear about this progression of the UFC and like you would really not even think if you if you just were just a new fan you wouldn't think of how real this is like this is Dana White has been there from the beginning man like this is you see this from fucking UFC one to now and it almost gives me goosebumps to think about how far that this really came of like how this like chaos, like just fucking complete chaos, just throwing these guys in there with fucking just complete mess in a way we'll say, right? <laughs> then you got the government trying to shut you down. You got the fucking governors coming in, trying to shut you down. Everyone's trying to shut you down. The C words come now is absolutely one of the most remarkable things I think that's ever happened in sports history. Um, and it's something that's not really talked about as, as much as that you would think, but I, I think it's one of the, the, one of the great stories of MMA as well. I couldn't agree more. I mean, look, look at where we're at now. We went from canceling events, going to Dothan, Alabama with like two days notice or one day notice to being yeah. on ESPN. Like, this is crazy. No, it's absolutely, you really think, dude, like, there's fucking fights every single week. You, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I saw someone like, you know, so this one of the guys, I forget his name, so I'm not, can't name drop him because I don't know about on Twitter, but he's absolutely hilarious. 
And he's like, yeah, I told the wife I'm only going to drink fight night. You know, he's like, good thing there's fights Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm just like, that's the reality, though, now. It's like, holy shit, like, MMA is fucking booming, man. It's awesome to see. And really, that that's a huge thing to the UFC. I, I, all these other promotions, you know, they're doing great, too. There's a lot of other good promotions out there, but there's there, you look at anyone, you know, the UFC's built this sport to what it is. When are you going to make the trip out to Russia for this fight? And, and have you been to Russia before? Is this your first time making the trip out there? I, I've never I've never been out there, man. I'm, I'm excited. I've heard great things. You know, I'm single now, too. So that's going to be, you know, that's going to be pretty fun. <laughs> and, but no, honestly, it, it's a business trip. So uh, it's a business trip. But I, I think I've heard great things about Moscow. It's going to be cold, though. You know, it's going to be about third, high 32 or something like that. So I'm like, I'm not really looking forward to that. But. Uh, I'm looking forward to go out there and showcase my skills. And I've been in the gym grinding, man. I've been working hard and I've been, you know, I'm just happy, man. I, I really am. I, I don't know like if this is what happiness is, but if this is what it is, you know, I feel pretty good. Um, you, you so look pretty content right now. I got to say. Yeah. I mean, I'm living it, man. So I'm over here. I'm just going to go enjoy the journey. I'm going to go out there. I think Ramazan's tough as hell, but you know, I'm telling you right now that I'm going to take him out. It's not going to be because he's not a good fighter. I think he, he could win a lot of fights, but he's just not on my level. So, like, when you visualize this fight playing out, you say you're going to take him out. Is there a specific way you see it? See it early? I mean, this is a yeah, statement. Yeah, I do. I do you have a make a statement way. here. I have a specific way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it out before the, before the fight. So when I finish him like this, that I'm going to pull out the papers so everyone sees it. Um, I like it. So I, think, I, I do think that I have a the, – the, first off, I think I can finish him in – 20 different ways but I, I see one way that's a, a easy way that no one no one's gonna expect you know what i mean i think that expect oh, the unexpected and it's kind of crazy if you think about it and but after the fight you know maybe we'll hit we'll, we'll link up and, and talk about it i would love to do that uh, there are a couple other things i want to talk to you about yeah. uh, prior to making your ufc debut in 2014 you competed in onalaska wisconsin at three river throwdown and your opponent was a young man by the name of Thomas Gifford. You would go yeah. on to win that fight. You head to the UFC. He has since gotten there as well. And he just had that fight against Mike Davis in Tampa a couple weeks ago. And the fight yeah. was was brutal. I mean, there's been a big debate on whether or not the fight should have been stopped before before Mike put him away. Maybe Gifford was too tough for his own good. Before it, I mean, that, nasty, that, that knock was absolutely nasty to watch. I mean, I'm not a fighter. Yeah. You are a fighter. You've shared the cage with Thomas. Like, what did you think of that fight and how it played out and how it ultimately went and ultimately ended? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like you said, that it's 100% the, the ref's job. That's why the ref's in, the, in, in there, you know, to, to stop a fight when to protect the fighters from themselves, you know. And it's also, you know, I know his dad is in his corner and there's, you know, his team's in his corner. So at one point you just got to know, like, listen, like this is uh this is a health risk now. It's not a, you know, this isn't an ego problem and you got to save the fighter from themselves, you know, because we're knuckleheads, man. We're like, we'll go to the death. You know, really, if, if, if they like, if the UFC came to me and like, Hey, we want to do this fight to the death, you know, I really think that I'd probably do it, you know? And, uh, so I'm like, I'm just like, this is what the fighters are. This is what we do is what we fight. But, that fight was kind of crazy with me, me, and, me and Gifford. So what happened is a lot of people don't know the story about this, but we originally were going to fight in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Okay. And so we went out to St. Cloud, Minnesota way in all of a sudden the fight card got canceled. Okay. So he's all the way out there from, I forget exactly where he's from. We'll say Alabama or something like that. Yeah. He's, uh, so we go out there. We got to weigh in at the hospital because my coach calls up another promoter and he's like, "Hey, can we get this guy? Can we get these guys on your car?" And they got, and they're like, "We'll pay for it," you know. So if I pay for it, they're gonna just gonna pay Gifford. They're not gonna pay me. <laughs> 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 and so, uh, so then they're like, "All right, yeah, of course." Like, who wouldn't take a free fight? Um, so we. So we weigh in at the hospital, like we're talking, hanging out the whole time at the hospital, like, oh yeah, it's funny. And we're all of a sudden weighing at 175 pounds because we've been both taking this on short notice. Like really, I've been not knowing if I was going to fight or if I was going to fight because I've been having so many fights fall through at that point. So then next day, it's four hours away, by the way. St. Cloud's four hours, the Twin Rivers is four hours away. 
So we have to get in the car in the morning, you know, and then we all drive out to the fight. It was the weirdest fight I've ever been to outside of the Australia fight. Uh, but when I went out there, we just, we drove down there about four hours, pretty much talking before the fight, get in the cage. I can more him second round. And then it was good, tough fight though. I mean, like I had, at this time I had zero striking. Okay. So like, if you watch the Mike Davis fight and you're seeing Mike Davis piece him up. Okay. I felt like it was the exact opposite. Okay? <laughs> I was just like, I don't know. So I was like taking him down. Then we ended up in these weird spots. But anyways, I ended up morning him second round, uh, finished him, and then literally got in the car right after the fight and left. It was like I wasn't even out of fight because I had no one there because everyone was supposed to be in St. Cloud. And then last thing everyone's going to do is drive four hours down to, you know, where we were at. So that was kind of crazy. But, no, I think it's the, you know, the fighters aren't going to quit, man. It's not our job to – our job is to go out there and never give up on ourselves. That's kind of how you train too is, like, push through the pain – um, and always keep pushing through. Uh, so other little cool tidbit I'll, I'll throw out there myself, just since we haven't really talked about it. Let's do it. But, uh, you know, so Rocky four, you know, where he fights that Russian, I don't know. No one's really ever asked me about where I got my tattoo from. So I have one tattoo on my side that says no pain and it was from Rocky four. So now it's kind of, so when, when he was fighting, when he went out to Russia, right throughout the whole training, they just kept telling him no pain, no pain. And then if you watch like the first three or four rounds of the fight, they just kept saying no pain, no pain. Not saying, hey, you're not going to feel pain, okay? Because life is full of pain, man. Emotionally, physically, everything. It's just about keep pushing through that pain. So now I think it, you know, it's kind of just that weird spot in my life where I think it's just spitting for me to head out to Russia and, uh, you know, really bring out the Rocky in myself, I guess. Cause that moved me obviously enough to get a tattoo. My one and only tattoo probably be my only tattoo ever. Um, so I've been actually running up. They have a mountain here called stone mountain. <laughs> I swear to God, I run this thing like two, three times a week. And every single time I feel like Rocky and all my buddies think I'm messing around. And then the two, two of my buddies I brought on this run and they're like, no, nah, that, that runs for real. So, uh, I'm feeling good, man. I'm loving life. Please I'm tell me. Better. Please tell me you have hearts on fire playing in the background as you're running up there. <laughs> no, I actually, I have like, uh, I just Pandora. Dang, what about Pandora? I forget what about Pandora. I was just thinking about it, but a great group though. I love them because they're all positivity. You know, this group that I'm listening to, it's all pure positivity where I feel like a lot of music that motivates me is more negative. So I've been trying to, you know, get more positive in my life. Well, there you go. And uh, I'm, just because you said it, uh, you yeah. said it a couple of times because this is the, this these are the kind of fights you want. And if you've been asked about this a bunch of times, you should probably have. And if it's redundant, I'm sorry. But a week no prior worries. to your fight, Jorge Mazadal is about to fight Nate Diaz at MSG yeah. for the baddest mf or title. You want to fight the baddest mf as you can. What are your thoughts on the baddest mf or title and, and this fight coming up next weekend in New York? Man, so what I'll... <laughs> I've gone back and forth on it. You know, I've thought, obviously, they're not the baddest motherfuckers. Like, it's just the facts. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not talking shit. I'm just, that's just 100% the facts. I said in a tweet that it could be the realest motherfuckers. You know what I mean? Like, these are the two guys that they're 100%. You know, you see them on the streets. They're not going to be any different than they are when you're seeing them on the TV or on the screen. You know, that's just who they are. So, the realest motherfuckers, they are bad motherfuckers. Like, let's be serious. Like, obviously, they're bad motherfuckers. They're ready to scrap, but. You know, they're definitely not the baddest, not even close to the baddest. But it's a money fight, man. It's just like when 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 Connor fought Floyd, you know, boxer will say boxers will come out there and say, Oh, they would never do this in boxing. Boxing made a money belt. What do you mean? They made a money belt for Floyd and uh, Connor. So don't say they want to do this type of shit. It's a it's an entertainment business. Those two guys are right now are, are the hottest in the game of you know, their their popularity is skyrocketed. And and if Masvidal doesn't give you motivation of like seeing a guy just like flip a script on his whole entire career in two fights, man, you're talking about two, this guy would, you know, what lost two in a row, you know, close fights, but not, you know, Damien, I thought Damien won all three rounds versus him. And, uh, you see how he flipped that script in two fights after taking about a year and a half off that can, that can give anyone motivation to be like, Hey, you're, you're, you're always just one fight away from being a superstar, really. It's crazy, right? Like no, how things can change. And... 
just like that. It's literally just literally they, they bring him in off two years off the couch. Like, hey, you know, we're going to bring you in. We're going we're gonna to feed you to Till because they want Till to be the superstar. So they're going to feed you to Till. And then he goes out and cri- cripples Till right away, you know, and that really boosts his stock. And then you had Aspen at the right time gets a crazy fight, you know, with uh, Lawler, that crazy win. And then his his stock's high from this weird fight. You just don't really know. And then, man, all, all the stars aligned at one time for him. You know what I mean? I know you've obviously, being an ATT, have worked and, and probably trained with Maz at all at different points in your career. But are you happy for a guy like that? I mean, he's, he's a hard worker. He's, you know, he's a real guy. And to yeah. see what he's done – over this last year has just been absolutely incredible. Are you happy for him to, to see what he's been able to do? What, what I'm always happy for anyone that's going to make a lot of money, you know, because the sport is unforgiving. It's brutal. And there's a lot of fighters. I'd say about 95 to maybe, maybe, maybe even higher than that. Probably like 98%. I'll say 95% of UFC fighters, you know, that leave this sport with nothing, you know, and uh, you know, you don't really see that. And it's tough, you know, cause this is what we do, man. Like, there's nothing else. So, like, when you people are begging these guys to retire, they have nothing else to fall onto. You know, they're, this is it. Like, this is they're they're, you know, they they have nothing else going for them, and they really just thought that that was the money that they're gonna keep making for the rest of their lives, and they just don't see that the. But so a guy like that, where you see him, he does work hard, and uh, he's put in his time, man. That guy's had a million fights. He's been at this game for a long ass time, and it's just nice to see a guy capitalize on that. You know. It, the worst thing to see, I feel like, is to see like when Nick and Nate were sitting out for that long, when their stock was so high. It's like, man, you did, you worked. This is your life, man. Like you've worked so hard to have your stock this high, and for you to sit on that sidelines and not capitalize on it, that's tough to watch. You know what I mean? And that's when you're like, man, these guys are idiots. But uh, so make big money like this. It's awesome to see for the sport, and awesome to see for those guys. And it's just one of those things that you know you just you just keep plugging away. You put in your time and, and you just, you know, you, sometimes you just got to manifest your own destiny. And there's a lot of drama over there now with Colby Covington and Poirier and Mazadal yeah. and all that stuff. Uh, not sure what your experiences have been with Colby, but, you know, a lot of people I've talked to who have trained with Colby until probably recently when all this stuff started coming out about how these guys want to fight Colby the first time they see him. Colby's been a great teammate. He's, he's actually a great guy. This is all just a shtick and in, in a pro wrestling type gimmick. What have your experiences been like with Colby? None of those guys really train together. You know, like I was telling you before that all the top guys kind of, uh, you know, they're pampered, man. Like they don't even want really that tough of rounds. It's, I'm not talking shit. I'm just saying like they'll go with tough guys, you know, and stuff like that. But, you know, when I walk into a room, man, I'm looking for the toughest striker, the toughest grappler, the toughest wrestler. But I have no problems with Colby. You know, I, I, I don't think he's the most intelligent guy. And uh, but I also think like, I don't know, like he, he's in that that spot where he's like, fuck it. You know, you can hate me, but you just gotta come beat me. So it's kind of like that thing that he can say whatever the fuck he wants if he ain't getting his ass whooped, you know. So it's one of those things. He, he he's talking that shit, but he he's ready to get in there if, if if you're gonna put the belt on the line and put the money on the line. It's not like he's running from those fights, but he's not gonna be going out in the street. He's not gonna be trying to go, go looking for a on the street or nothing. You know? <laughs> he's sorry, like, yeah, but now nah, I think it's just the gym's so big, man. Where they you can have two guys fighting in the same gym that don't even cross paths really, you know? So it's not even, there's not going to be a problem with that. And I've trained with Dustin. I love training with Dustin. I've, I've been trained. I feel like Masvidal has been, you know, uh, I think Masvidal is a guy that has to hate you to fight you. You know what I mean? So he's one of the guys that doesn't want to like someone that he fights. So he's kind of distanced himself from a lot of the 70 pounders. So we didn't really do a lot of training. I, I don't know why we didn't do a lot of training, but uh, we didn't do a lot of training when we were there. But, I mean, I've seen him grinding in there, and, and he works hard, you know, so he's in there. Um, and Colby, Colby's for real, man, I'll tell you right now. You don't know it's real until you feel it, you know. So I think that if Usman really thinks that – if Usman goes in that fight thinking that Colby has no chance, he's in for a long night, man. Because I'll tell you right now, this guy's got the freakiest cardio. I, I mean, you – you hear about it, you know what I mean? You hear about it, you kind of see it, but until you feel it, I feel like I got pretty good cardio, man. I feel like I got, I'm not like, I'm not a cardio freak. I don't have like a crazy pace, but I mean, I feel like I'm always in these fights where third round, all these guys are gassed and I'm still going just fine. 
But I'll tell you right now, if I go in the fight with Kobe, I'm going to be like, listen, I better take those early rounds. You know? <laughs> I better take those early rounds or, or put them away because uh, if I make it a long night like that, if I give him that, if, if I make a cardio fight with this guy, like I'm telling you right now, I don't care how good your cardio is, you're going to fade first. When it comes to you and your trajectory, I mean, you've shared the cage with, with Damian Maia. You had a little setback, but now you get a chance to get back on track November 9th in Moscow. Now, if all goes the way you hope it does, where do you think that puts you in the landscape of this division? Like, what kinds of fights make sense moving forward? Like, what will you be seeking with a win in a little over two weeks' time? Not that you're looking past Ramazan. Yeah, no, honestly, like, I think that uh, I need to put Ramazan away. I, I, I really don't think that I won't come out of Russia satisfied with a decision win. I, I don't think so. I don't think the UFC either would. You know, so I think that I need to put him away. And if they don't want to give me top 15, which I think that I deserve, you know, uh, after this win, then I was thinking, I saw Diego Sanchez, you know, talking about he wants to fight someone that's not this giant 70 pounder. You know, I walk around about 180 pounds. So if he wants someone that's not going to get in there at 200 pounds, you know, I'm definitely that guy where, I mean, I, I don't really want to pick on Diego. I think that's an easy fight. You know, I really, I really think that I, uh, I'm on a whole nother level than him, but it would be fight. It'd be nice to man share a cage with some legend like that too. You know, like this guy that's, Another guy, UFC one, you know, our UFC uh, Ultimate Fighter one, has been around for forever. That'd be, you know, it'd be an honor to fight someone like that. And, and and I mean, I obviously think that I'd put him away as well. But something like that, or Nico Price, you know, Nico Price was kind of talking a little shit before the fight. I think he's a tomato can. I really don't think he's that good. I think he's just, you know, man, this guy's just another guy's just got a fucking horseshoe so far up his ass, and he's just a wild man very entertaining the fight it's always is it not crazy thing about this these guys that are complete trash are so entertaining because they're so fucking garbage that they have to be entertaining it's like they their only skill set is that they're so tough for their own good that they can only go forward and be wild and kind of just be this knucklehead that it's so it does make exciting fights there's no doubts about it and it's like all of a sudden you get a guy i'll say i'll just use myself as an example where I can just methodically pick pick you apart, and it's like, oh, you're a boring fighter. Okay, I'm landing four to one, but I'm a boring fighter because you can't land the punch because you're a trash fighter. No, so like when I got that heat from when I fought Sergio Moraes, where I was like, man, I'm landing like, you know, three to one on this guy, and doing all this damage, and it's a boring fight because what? Because I'm not just going blow for blow with the guy. What do you want me to stand in the pocket and go blow for blow? Anyways. Long story short, I think Nico Price is garbage. He, he was talking a lot of shit. I would be willing to smash him as well. Millinder was kind of trying to talk shit. was the worst shit talking I've ever felt in my whole life. Even though it was cringy, like, reading it. Because you know, it's hard. To, you can't start beef with someone that you have no beef with. You know, So it's like he was kind of trying to get a fight going. So Curtis Millinder I'd like to take out. If This is outside the top 15. If the UFC, I feel like I should be in the top 15. I think that that Damian fight was the worst fight of my life. And it's going to give me some nightmares even just thinking about it. But I, I'm ready, man. I, I really think that it's my time to make a run. You got fucking – this is not even me talking shit because I like uh, – I like uh, – what's his name that stepped uh, – de- uh, dang it. Gilbert Burns. So Burns just stepped in. He's all, the, all of a sudden in the top 15. Come on, bro. He's not top 15. I, I don't give a shit what anyone says. He's a great guy, great fighter, but he hasn't earned his stripes in, in the welterweight division. <laughs> and really, I've always said that uh, what's-his-name was overrated. You know, and That's why I was trying to step in on two weeks' notice as well. You know, I called up. We had the same manager. But I was uh, – Gilbert Burns, great guy, but he he's definitely not top 15. And – He's, you know, he's plugging himself the right way, but I mean, like, what do, you, what do you mean? Like, he's got squeaked out, what, two decisions or something like that? Like, the top 15? Yeah. Gunnar Nelson, what do you mean? Gunnar Nelson has been fucking downhill so fucking far. I haven't even seen someone ski downhill so fast. Uh, so I'm just like, in, in what? I fucking went out four fights and was got ranked in the top 15 for one one day. One day, all of a sudden, I'm fucking top 15, and then all of a sudden, they're like, no, nah, just kidding, you know what I mean? And then they fucking bump me out, and I'm over here like, okay, you know, came off finishing two guys, and then uh, 
30, two 30 27s and two finishes I had in the welterweight division before Damien. And this guy's going out there, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, he's not looking like a killer. So I don't know how to get ranked in the top 15, but all I know is that I need to finish Ramazan. I'll keep, hey, I'll fucking talk all day. Okay? Hey, listen. You get me going. I'll I got like 15 more minutes before I have to pick my kid up. We're good, man. <laughs> We're good. I mean, I hear you talking about the rankings. And a lot of people will look at the rankings and be like, eh, they're kind of crap because of like who's putting them together. You know what I mean? I feel like yeah. I've, I've heard they're making some changes, bringing in some new people to to, to help with the rankings and, and have them make a little bit more sense. But what are your thoughts on the rankings overall? Like, do you think they're the real deal? Do you, no. d- is it, is I mean, it is who cool knows to have that number? The, how is, I don't understand even how it's even close to the real deal right now. I, I feel like a lot of those guys are getting wiped out by someone in the top 10 and all of a sudden they're like fighting a guy in the top 10 again. What do you mean? Like, no, you just got wiped out. Like, you should, 100%, you should have to fight a contender. I feel like you lose in the top 10, right? You lose a top 15 fight, you have to fight a contender right away. So that's like, I have no problem fighting a contender after the Damien fight. Okay, all of a sudden, he gets moved up to 10. You know, we get a close-ass fight. He gets he gets bumped up. I get dropped off the planet. And I'm over here like, all right. And then, but so even like my manager, I was like, hey, like, he's like, if you're not in the top 15, you they're not going to give you top 15. All right, well, if you if they're only giving guys the top 15, top 15 fights, how the fuck do you get in the top 15? You know what I mean? So I'm just like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Okay, you have, uh, let's use, what's his name? Dos Anjos. See, I destroy this guy. Why am I not fighting Dos Anjos? This guy's lost, what, three, three in a row or something like that, or he's lost a few in a row. It's like, he should fight a contender. Fight a fucking contender. Like, what do you mean? Like, no, you're not fighting a top 10 guy. No, you've lost three in a row, the top five guys. Okay, it's now it's time for you to fucking see if this contender's for real. You know, so that's what I think. I think that after this fight with Dos Anjos, I'll tell you right now, I'll take out Dos Anjos, easy. That's I, mean, I, I think fight. so. I want a five-round fight next. You know, I, I think I'm a five-round fighter. That's the only thing that I feel like, if you watch my last you know, five fights, that third round, these guys are fading, you know, and I'm just getting stronger, you know? So I think that I'm a five-round fighter, and I, I, I would look forward to having a five round fight after this one. I want to get your take on this. Make it, you know, just saying what you just said because you look at a guy like like Mickey Gall. Mickey Gall is about to fight Carlos Condit in Washington D.C. You're being sent to Russia to fight Ramazan. How many guys do you think would take that fight? One percent. One percent of the UFC roster. Right. Hey, hey, you want to head to Russia? Fight a Russian in Russia? Hell, fucking no. I said, hey. Let's go. Let's go to fucking Russia. So I'm like, how many guys? But yeah, like you said, man, don't get me amped up on Mickey Go. <laughs> Not a Mickey fan. I will say, I, I've Mickey and I have a little bit of a relationship. I've known him for a while. I had his first interview after he got off Dana White's looking for a fight. They are Listen, feeding. We're not him friends, fish. but you know what I mean. They keep feeding him fights, man. Like they just feeding him, like leaving these legends out the pastor. He can't even take out fucking Diego Sanchez. Are we talking about how? How does Mickey Gall have a? UFC contract, and you can't even take out Diego Sanchez. You're supposed to be an upcoming stud. You can't take out Diego? I don't know what fucking excuses you're talking about. Diego is so over the hill that it's not even funny. Like, I'm talking about, you're talking about way over the hill, bro. Like, he's, like, you can say Damien's over the hill if you want, but who's taking out Damien? You're talking about only collegiate wrestlers have beaten Damien. I'm not a collegiate wrestler. I ain't going to lie to you. I, I mean, I thought that in the top 15, Damian Maia was one of the worst matchups for me just because he's such a, like, he's so good in one area. You know what I mean? That it's just like, you get in that area, what the fuck are you going to do? Don't play around there. But all excuses aside, Damian beat my ass. I ain't happy about it. I would love for that rematch, but obviously they're not going to give me that. But Mickey Gall, come on. How is this guy in the UFC anymore? I'm not saying, like, he's not... Somehow the people love him though, so they keep beating him. Living, you're fucking bringing out Condit the pastor right now. He's like, hey, here you go, Mickey. Like, we're gonna bring out fucking Carlos for you to eat. Like, what do you mean? What, what's the last takedown that Carlos has stopped? That's the question we should be asking. That's good has question. Carlos kind of ever stopped the takedown? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, I mean, if if he loses to Carlos Condit, he might as well wrap it up. The UFC, if the UFC doesn't cut him after losing to Condit. Come on, man. This is like, what are we talking about here? We're talking about everything right now. 
I don't know. But the division's so good. The division's just so deep right now. And now you got like guys like Kiesa, who looks really healthy at 170. He's on a nice little run. He looks better than ever being at 170. He looks healthy I mean, against Diego Sanchez. Of course, who doesn't look healthy against Diego Sanchez? <laughs> I meant like Sorry. physically and, ha- and just just overall happiness. I mean, you you made the move from 55 to 70. You probably know what he's feeling right now. Yeah, no, I, I like I like Kiesa too. Like he's a nice guy. I, I've talked to him a few times. I mean, I think that he's very beatable. I think that's another fight that I think that's a he's a very one dimensional fighter, and uh, but he's he's fucking pretty good at what he does. And you're planting seeds everywhere. You can not now you have the basis fight to fight all me. these guys. Listen, I, so that's what I'm saying. Like, listen, a guy that says, "Hey," takes a phone call. Hey, Tony, you're coming off a close fight with Damien in your hometown. Uh, you want to go to Russia and fight a guy that you, no one's ever heard of? Are you, you insane? <laughs> Are you fucking crazy? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, let's go to Russia. So I called my coach and said, hey, we're headed to Russia. He's like, all right. Like, you know, because they know, like, this is what I do. So I, I go out there and fight. I think I'm the best fighter in the world. And like you said, I, I don't know much about Ramazan. I think he's a good, good fighter. He's a decision master. I think that he's going to go out there and try to decision me. So I'm going to try to get him amped up in his hometown. I'm going to go after him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right now, tune into this fight, okay? I'm not going to fight how I normally fight. I'm not going to fight a safe fight here. I'm going to go out there and I, I'm going to – you want entertainment, I'm going to put the entertainment on the line, okay? If that's what, what the UFC wants, you want fucking entertainment, this fight's going to be entertainment, okay? Uh, I promise you right now Ramazan's going to be diving in, okay? He's going to film me. He's going to start diving in. And then who knows what kind of fight it turns into, you know what I mean? Because then if it just turns into a grappling fight, then that's what it turns into. But it ain't going to turn into a grappling fight because I'm, I'm diving in. All right? It's going to turn into a grappling fight because he doesn't want to stand and trade. Um, so I'm feeling good, Mike, man. I'm feeling, just you know, I'm feeling good, bro. <laughs> Listen, more importantly, more important than the fight itself, I'm happy to see you're in, in a really good place right now. I'm happy to see the sunshine behind you. I'm happy to see that... You're just in a, a good spot in Atlanta, and the things are starting to turn around for you. You're you got to travel to, to Phuket, got some clarity, got some fresh perspective, and, and you're feeling good right now. You feel like you got a new outlook on on life and your career, and things are going well. That's more important than the fight itself, in my opinion. So I'm happy for you, man. Yeah, no, thank you, man. I appreciate it. And life is good right now, man. I, I can't think of a better situation right at this moment of my life. So I'm just gonna enjoy it, man. I'm gonna go to Russia. I'm gonna whip some ass. Uh, and then you know, I might say some crazy shit. Who knows? And, and you know, I'm really just gonna enjoy the moment now. You know, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna kiss some UFC ass, and uh, you know, I'll work on work through that. You know, and really really make a push here. This is it, man. I, I really think that the UFC, you know, we don't have the greatest standing. So I got I gotta I gotta really look good in these next two fights. I I, I gotta get the fans on the side as well. It's not so much as the UFC on the side is getting everyone behind me and really prove to everyone that think about if i win these next two fights i'll be what nine and nine and two in my last 11 inside the ufc that's a rare sighting i think so if they let me go after that i think that'd be kind of uh at least my market price would be pretty high i think anthony rocco martin ufc company man ladies and gentlemen look for him at a metro pcs near you <laughs> meeting the fans and kissing babies and signing autographs i love it man. yeah Got to play some catch up here. It's been a while. I'm happy we got to do this. I always appreciate the time. We've definitely uh, made up for lost time. Before we let you go, yeah. as always, uh, let the folks know where they can find and follow you on the web. Any shout outs, anything else you want to get off your chest, social media stuff, floor is yours, man. Yeah, man, just tune into the fight. I'm telling you right now, November 9th, tune in. I think that's on ESPN Plus. Tune in November 9th. I promise you right now, if you think that I fought safe before, that this is going to be complete chaos. I'm coming out there. You know, I'm going to bring out my inner tomato can Nico Price and inner tomato can Mike Perry. You know, both trash fighters, but, you know, just big balls. So if that's what people want. If you just want them to go out there and see no skill and all balls, that's this fight. Man, look at this. I'm so fired up right now after talking to you, Anthony. <laughs> Thank you for the time, man. All the best to you the rest of camp and the big fight in Russia. Looking forward to it. All right, brother. Thank you, man. I appreciate it.